Yeah, y'all still asleep. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can do better than that. Good morning. Yeah, much better. Thank you, guys. Hey, uh, we do have several announcements today. The first announcement I want to make, uh, Jonathan Thomas is here. He's uh, from Florida. Uh, well, he's currently residing in Florida, but he is one of the applicants for uh, being a preacher here at the church. He's just kind of coming in, seeing, seeing our church, seeing the congregation, and he will be out here. Uh, so if you want to stop by and see him, um, uh, we'll, we'll have somebody next to him, make sure you know who he is. But, uh, but yeah, if you have any questions for him, and uh, do go by and see him because he, he has made a trip here to see how, see how the church is and uh, the, he loves the many things that we are doing here, for sure. Um, we had a meeting with him last night over, over dinner and I like him already. He likes subs, so we, uh, so yeah, he's he's a great guy. So if you do, and if you want to, stop by and see Jonathan. Uh, his last name is Thomas, uh, but uh, and then right after service today, and uh, uh, we will be having a VBS meeting. So stick around for that. Uh, Rose Rose will be over uh, in the other fellowship hall there. So um, we'll have a meeting right after service. Today at 5.30 is Share the Love event. Today at 6 is our evening service, our FBI Youth and Beginner Bible Bowl. Monday from 6 to 8 is our Teen Bible Bowl. Monday at 6 is the Family Tree Workshop. Alan will be leading that. And I know he mentioned last week, if you do, if you're coming, uh, bring your smartphone or a tablet like me. I should have my glasses on. The smoke, phones are usually smaller, but uh, I mean, just come on. We'll, we'll, if you don't have one or the other, we'll help you out with that as well. So, uh, and then we have youth at six o'clock on Wednesday. We will we'll be meeting here. We'll have a, um, we'll have a game night. And then also we're talking about the Jesus Revo uh, Revolution movie as well. And then also at 6 p.m., is the choir practice. Wednesday at 7 is Bible study here at the church. Saturday is the Sisters of Grace. They will meet here at 8.30. At 8.30 for the breakfast and cleaning day here at the church. March the 26th, uh, it's a Sunday singing. And I made up an acronym this morning, and it's BYOD. Anybody know what that spells? Bring your own dessert. So they were going to have a dessert night right after the singing there uh, next Sunday evening. April the 1st, the Ladies' Day at Macedonia, leaving here at 7.30. And also April the 1st here at 4 p.m. Uh, that's Nick Smith. They will be having a household shower here. April the 9th is our community uh, sunrise service over at the Green Hills Memorial. Um, I I really enjoy this service because you know we get to meet so many different people and uh, and it's just a great way to bring our community together. And we're we're blessed that they've asked us to come and do it for several years now. So if you want to come and do a sunrise service with us up there at seven on April the 9th. and then well I missed one April the seventh. We will be doing our Villa de la Rosa walk that we usually start off at Walmart and uh, we usually try to make it up to City on the Hill and it's, it's a very important walk and we have so many people that come out and join this walk with us. And then also April the 8th, the next day it's Saturday, we'll have an Easter egg hunt down at Dave and Brittany's farm. And if you want to go ahead and start bringing uh, candy and eggs and things like that for, for us to put together, the youth put together, or if you like to put it together yourself. Uh, so we'll, we'll take up uh, donations for the egg hunt. And I think last year it seemed like there was, I don't know, it blew up. There was like, I don't know, over a thousand plus eggs down there. So the kids really enjoyed it. It was a great time. Uh, so keep them uh, dates in mind. April the 22nd, Ladies' Day at Maple View, leaving here at 7.30. May the 4th through the 6th, uh, the Young at Heart will be going to the uh, Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum, and a Reds game. I don't know. 
I don't know how the Reds game got in there, Alan, but uh, <laughs> but they will be having a great time. They always have a great time, the Young at Heart group. And then also June the 19th through the 23rd, it's our VBS here at the church. And, you know, we can't talk enough about the VBS because, you know, there's a lot of kids that this is the only time they get to come to church. And there's a, you know, a great group of people that lead that up, a great group that always volunteers. And if you want to help volunteer, see Rose uh, or Sandy one af uh, at any time because, you know, this is something that's very important because if you look around and the way that the youth is blowing up in this, uh, especially on Wednesday nights, of how many people are coming. It's just, I mean, it's crazy to see how many youth are coming and wanting to learn God's Word. So uh, do keep that in mind. That's all the announcements I have for today. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries today or this coming week. I have a couple. Uh, Mama Lou, uh, that's Lou Collin. She has one on the 20th. Jackson Pruitt has one on the 21st. And the 22nd is Melinda Kennedy, and the 23rd is Doug uh, Kennedy. Do we have any others? If not, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Callum. Baby cousin, uh, Cameron uh, Logan. Oh, okay. Cameron? Any others? If not, let's sing happy birthday to those. Happy Be moving into our prayer list. I have a a couple here. Uh, keep Janice Boyd in your prayers, not feeling well. Bev Thompson, uh, keep her in your prayers. She has uh, breast cancer and uh, she'll be going to Texas next week for surgery, so keep her in your prayers. Um, also, little baby Tyson, uh, Die, will be born this week. Uh, they, they're going to induce her by Tuesday if it hasn't had it by then, so Keep the Dye family and the Collins family in your prayers as a little one is born into this uh, world. Some continued prayers, John Ball, Lincoln Perkins, and uh, and then also uh, Norman Parrott, that's Dizera's dad, was injured on a four-wheeler and was taken to Roanoke. Uh, keep Brenda Johnston, uh, it's in hospice care. And then also Misty Ramey is going for uh, some doctor's appointments this week. So keep her in your prayers. Do we have others to add? What did you say their last name was? Schoonover. Schoonover? <laughs> I think I got it. You know, and that's the great thing about the Lord. I mean, even though if... You don't have to have it perfect because we're not perfect. And I'm so thankful that because if we, was, if we were perfect, man, none of us would <laughs> fit the mold. But do we have others to add today? Uh, okay. Friend I was in the military with, he's in hospice care with Dennis Walton. Marcella? Others? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kitty.
for sure. Other April. Uh, also, remember my mom. She's uh, she did get to go home. She went for a PET scan. Uh, she's had cancer several times, but uh, swelling on the brain with seizures and all that. So keep her in your prayers. Um, do we have others to add? If not, uh, I'd like for you to stand up and we'll have a prayer for those that were mentioned. Brother Dave, you care to leave some prayer? Our Father God in heaven, we're so thankful to be in your house again to hear another portion of your word, Lord, and we humbly come to you, uh, the great physician, and ask that your blessing be upon uh, those on the prayer list, their families. Uh, we pray that for your healing, for your comfort. Uh, you know what each situation needs, Lord, and we just pray if it be your will for you to work those situations pray, Lord, for your brother Alan as he brings today's message, Lord, and I pray you forgive us when we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our communion meditation, if uh, you didn't grab your communion, it's on the back table. Union time, I'll make a comment about VBS. Um, I didn't realize till a few years ago, uh, um, we started sharing supplies with some of the churches in town, Cedar Bluffs One, Community Heights, and you know, there's the, just as Josh said, there's those kids that through the year, that may be the only time that they hear the message of Jesus Christ. and. Um, I, I feel as VBS is just an invaluable tool of the church uh, to reach kids. But on the flip side of that, in borrowing these supplies, we picked those up on the last night of the other Bible school. And I found out that, you know, some people hit the ro rodeo circuit in the summer. We got a lot of kids, they hit the VBS circuit in the summertime. <laughs> which is great, kids. Hit them all. Hit them all. Uh, I, always, I thought that was funny when we I was like, God, I never really thought that they, that they go to all these VBSs. So it's, it's great. Um, our verse for today, uh, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, uh, before our meditation today. And I'll go ahead and read that. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of, the, in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Imitators, imitators of God. And that's, what I, that's the thought I want you to grab this morning. And as I thought about this, I, I, I know a lot of you know uh, Nick Smith and they're going to have a baby shower. That's Bob and Ruth's son. Well, baby shower, gosh, am I... Ruth's not in here, is she? <laughs> She's on the floor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wedding shower. <laughs> Getting the car before the horse then. Um, but if you know Nick, and if you got to meet Ruth's dad, I don't remember his name. I can't remember his name right, right off right now. But I can see it as clear as day. Nick walking down that bathroom hallway, and her dad did the same thing. He walked with them hands. And this is when Nick was three or four years old. There you go, Nick, walking down. <laughs> Look, just, just like his grandpa. Um, and may, maybe you can see that. In, I know I see it in some of your kids. I, I see you in, in the, some of the things that they do. Imitator. Here's some definitions. Carbon copying. Nobody, <laughs> kids don't know what those are anymore, but carbon copying. To have or assume the appearance of, to follow or try to follow, to produce something which exactly resembles or corresponds to something else. A likeness of the original. All these are definitions of imitator. How many of you know someone whom you are so close to that you can talk like them, 
You can think like them. Maybe you can even write like them. Some of these guys are kind of like, you're describing my wife. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I, I know her exactly. To be able to do that means you've what? You've spent time, lots of time. And not just time, we say the word what? Quality time. And you think back through the week, how much quality time have we spent with their family? And I'm, I fall right into this, folks. I mean, I get up, go to work, do all these other things. If we put time to it, it's a short amount of time that we have with one another. And then we think, how much quality time did I spend with God this week? How do we spend quality time with God? Doing the things God wants us to do. Being in prayer, being in His Word studying, being here today, being around the table to remember His Son. Jesus Christ. When you thoroughly know another person, you can predict what he or she will think about a given situation. And sometimes, guys, we need to keep that to ourselves when we're trying to predict what our wives are saying. You can determine how this person will respond because you know their thinking patterns and you know their habits. Paul says we are to be imitators of Christ. To be an imitator of Christ, we must become like Him. To become like Him means we have to spend quality time with Him, walking with Him, talking with Him. We have to truly comprehend the price that He paid for our redemption. When we begin to realize the depth of His love for us, then we can truly begin to know Him and strive to be like Him. Each time we meet around his table, let us remember, first of all, his gift of salvation, his precious body, his precious blood. But let us also determine to be like him. That's what Paul told us. If we're like him, then what? We're doing exactly what God wants for us to be doing in our lives. And to begin that, we have to become a part of his family and that's being saved by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Brother Shane, will you lead us in prayer? I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we can partake together today. It reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Remember, he's broken by us, partake of the bread. After the same manner also he took the cup when he supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember his precious shed blood. Let's partake of the cup.
everybody. What a joyous day to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, we had an opportunity. We took, I don't know how many kids, we went to the mall and we watched Jesus uh, Revolution and we had um, pizza and we had, uh, my mom brought up like a bunch of donuts and and uh, we, uh, we went and watched the movie, and uh, we was all busy giving drinks out and stuff. And I finally sat down. I caught just a little bit, uh, missed the first part of the movie. It was so powerful. I mean, I was, I was in tears, and I clapped. And, and our kids were getting it. You could hear them in the background. They'd say, amen, and they were clapping in the background. I just want to remind everybody here and everybody watching online that all of God's people are welcome in his house. And it don't matter if you've got tennis shoes on or blue jeans or your shirt's untucked or a t-shirt. That's the first thing you ask. When somebody asks you when you invite them to church is, well, well I ain't got anything to wear. <laughs> as long as you got something on, that's all that matters. <laughs> no naked people allowed in here. <laughs> but it was, it was just so touching and so, so moving. There was one scene that I really, really liked. Some of the um, older congregation who were not used to the style that the hippies brought in. They didn't like it that the hippies were in there because they were barefoot and they just got the carpets cleaned. And I rolled my eyes. So you've got to be kidding me. Tear the carpet out. Come on. That's what, that's what it's about. Broken people. This is a place, if you're broken, you can be healed. If, if you're blind, then you can see. This is, this is what we're for here. This is what the Lord uses us for. So... The next Sunday, there was a line of people trying to get into the church. And a lot of them were these hippies. And the preacher was washing all of their feet. One by one. I thought, that's so powerful. But the Lord brought that uh, to us. And our kids are going to be able to see that. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful example that the Lord gave us. But we are, we're in our, our series. Um, and we're going to look at the next fruit of the Spirit. Uh, gentleness. I have so much Enjoyed. We got one message left uh, next week, and it's probably one of the hardest ones. It's called self control. <laughs> but uh, we, we've been looking at these characteristics that God wants us to grow and produce in our lives. Now, I want you to imagine yourself in the grocery store. If you shop for groceries in your household, raise your hand. Okay, good, it's good. Me, I didn't raise my hand because I get, I, I get a text Can you stop by Walmart? That's not really shopping, you know. Regularly for your family. So, okay, I'll get you know, whatever you need me to get. Just a couple little things. I'm in and out. Uh, but I mean, regular shop. But imagine you're in the, um, the grocery store and you walk through the produce department picking out some fruits. Think about the fruits that you buy. I mean, I can see right now on our counter what we have. Uh, chances are, if you're like most of us, you, you'll buy apples. I love any kind of apple. I like mine with salt on them. Anyway, sweet and salty. Uh, bananas. I don't like the texture of bananas. I don't eat bananas. I know Landon don't like bananas. Is that right? We won't share that story. <laughs> uh, grapes. Like grapes, right? And you know oranges and uh, strawberries when they're in season. But there are some fruits in the produce department that usually get overlooked. Uh, they are dis the disrespected fruits. Some of us aren't even aware that they are fruits. How many of you... Uh, be honest, buy figs. Okay, so we got one with figs. Fig Newtons don't count, because I like Fig Newtons with peanut butter, by the way. They're fantastic. Uh, how many of you buy dates? Okay, good. You know what I mean. D dates in the fruit section, not the other kind of dates, okay? Not that farmer's only stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, how many of you buy rhubarb? Buy rhubarb. Nobody buys it. How many grows it? Oh, that's disgusting. That is awful. When you have to make something taste good by mixing it with another fruit, it's not good, okay? It's not even do. No, I'm not a rhubarb fan whatsoever. But, um, but some of you are saying, uh, wait, wait a minute. I know when I said rhubarb, you said, wait, isn't rhubarb a vegetable? No, it's not. Because it must have been a really slow judiciary year in 1947. Civil, I mean, there was World War II had ended. Uh, so the U.S. Supreme Court, no kidding, ruled officially that rhubarb is a fruit. <laughs> yeah. But does anybody know what fruit this is? Raise your hand or say it out loud if you know the next fruit. Who said that first? Pawpaw. That's right. It's a pawpaw. How many of you eat a, eat, eat a pawpaw? 
I think it's got to be really, really ripe. Is that right? right? No, I don't like the texture. You forget it. I run over them in the road a lot. They just fall out in the road. But that's a pawpaw fruit. That's right. So there are these, the figs, the dates, the rhubarbs that just don't seem to get much attention. They've, they're very rarely do we go out of our way to get one of these fruits. We just, we just don't think of them uh, much. Uh, these are the forgotten fruits. Now, as we study uh, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, gentleness tends to be the rhubarb of the Spirit of the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Sorry, I got it wrong there. Gentleness tends to be uh, the uh, fruit that we know is on the list. We read it all the time, but not many of us want it. We don't think that much about gentleness. I mean, we, I mean, we pray for love and joy and peace and patience, and we want all those things in our life, but gentleness, it just doesn't seem very necessary, all right? It's, it's not something that we pray for, that we, that we want. Gentleness doesn't make the grocery list, if you know what I mean. We just don't have an appetite for gentleness. And I'm not sure that it's something that we, we forget about. It doesn't really sound like something that, that we even want. I mean, when, when we think of gentleness, we think of gentleness, we think of, of this weak and this passive person who gets walked on and picked on all the time. I mean, their, their character and their type of person just gets pushed around. Honorable mention on the gentleness list, uh, when you look at movies and TV shows, is Gomer Pyle. You remember Gomer Pyle? It definitely fits the case. Gilligan. Gilligan was gentle. Napoleon Dynamite. Anybody remember Napoleon Dynamite? He, it's, yeah, that's right. That's right. He, he, he's definitely on the list. Urkel. Okay, I grew up with Urkel. I knew Urkel. Uh, Rudy. Great, great movie. Rudy. He got pushed on, picked on, and he kept on coming back. And how about one, somebody may not have forgot about this one, Lucas. A movie called Lucas back in the 80s. Love that movie, uh, Lucas. Okay, but top three, show, show that next picture. Anybody know who this is? Or what movie he plays on? Back to the Future, George McFly. George McFly, if you haven't seen Back to the Future, wonderful movie. Um, but he gets picked on a lot. And how about the next one? Forrest Gump. Wow, he was a gentle, gentle, definitely gentle guy. And the number one has got to be... Barney Pipe. Yeah, Barney is definitely just so gentle. Um, but I mean, we never use gentleness to describe ourselves. We're filling out a resume. You don't write gentle on there. Nobody ever hires a gentle person. No employer ever says, you know what we're looking for. The exact person we're looking for is a gentle person. That's, that's what we want. You don't see that. I mean, instead we write that we are motivated, self-motivated, and ambitious and driven and on time, you know, that type of thing. You don't want to write gentle. If a politician is making a commercial, uh, trying to tell everybody why they should vote for them, you don't hear a politician describe themselves as gentle. You just don't see that. Athletes, athletes, have you ever seen the, the, the pictures? Emily bought a bunch of pictures, Emily did. If you don't see somebody on there going, you know, when they're taking their picture, like, Oh, I just love, I'm so gentle. You don't see that. You see aggressiveness. That's what athletes, they don't get the gentleness award at the end of the season. You don't see that. Gentleness doesn't get them much attention. If you're hiring an attorney, if you're hiring, you don't want a gentle attorney. You don't want, I remember when I was little or whatever, Gallback was the man to get. I mean, he was aggressive. That guy's going to win. You don't want some gentle puppy as a lawyer. No, you want an aggressive pit bull on your side. You want the heavy hitter, the one call, that's all type of person. You don't want any gentleness in there. You want somebody to do whatever it takes. And so gentleness tends to be something that we don't look for or desire in life. Matter of fact, Liberty University, I love Liberty University. You, 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 know, you can conceal carry at Liberty everywhere. <laughs> they encourage it if you're over 21. But they, they, it's a recent uh, survey where they listed 30 characteristics from Scripture that describe us as Christians. And then, then they asked a group of Christians to prioritize these 30 characteristics. 1 through 30. And after the survey was done, number 30 on the list of 30 was gentleness. Dead last. Why is that? Why isn't gentleness a fruit that we want? 
Well, we think of gentleness as weak. And when we hear gentle, we, we, we think, naturally, we think weak. We think a gentle person does not have what it takes to climb the ladder of success. When we think of power and success, we don't think gentle. When we think of gentleness, we think of a person who doesn't have the aggressive personality needed to win the big game. When we think of gentleness, we think of a person who gets walked on in relationships and they get taken advantage of. Gentle people don't get the good parking spots at Walmart. They just aren't willing to do what it takes. When we, when we, when we hear gentleness, we automatically think weak and we don't want it to describe us. In a thesaurus, gentleness means mild, docile, soft, tender. Who, who wants that unless you're a newborn baby? Speaking of that, we're going to have some grandparents soon. <laughs> Just any day now, we're going to have some grandparents in here. And, and a dad too. So, wow, that's, that's powerful. But when we, when, what we find in Scripture is gentleness is constantly used to describe a person who is full of the Holy Spirit. It is used to describe a follower of Jesus Christ. So what we need to do is have a better understanding of what Scripture is talking about when it talks about gentleness. So, so we're going to look at this word and try to understand it. Gentleness is translated from the Greek word prautes and prautes. And that, that word could be translated a few different ways. It could be gentleness or meekness or humble at heart. It's, it's helpful not to just look at the definition though, but also uh, to see how it is pictured in the New Testament. And, and in the book of Galatians, we, we, what was written in the, in the Greek language, and the nice thing about the Greeks is, is that when they wanted to come up with a, a word, they didn't just define it, they also illustrated it. They, 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 to give it the, a picture uh, along with the, with the word, and, and they, they're a very visual culture. And so when we look at that word prautes, we see a word, uh, a picture that goes along with it, and it helps understand the meaning, if you know what I mean. It's a picture of a horse, a powerful, wild stallion, but it has been tamed, and the reins handed over to the owner so that the owner can use the horse power to do what the farm needs done, right? And that's the picture that goes along with prautes. So a, a, a Bible's definition for this word would be power and strength that is under control to benefit someone else. Power and strength that is under control to benefit someone else. Five-year-old Levi lived with his parents on a farm, five years old, uh, with horses, the big Belgian kind. Some of the largest horses in the world. Huge and powerful. And little Levi could walk upright under the belly of these horses and not bump the bellies. But one, one day a team of Belgians were standing in the barnyard. Imagine the power and the bruteness of these horses strapped to a hitching bar lying on the ground behind them. And the bar could be hitched to wagons or other equipment and pulled you know, with a team of horses there. But Levi's dad told him, uh, say, uh, your, your brothers need this team of horses out in the field. So the little five-year-old boy picked up the reins and shouted a command at the horses. And large, the large horses did what the boy said, and he led them, and they calmly obeyed. That is power under control, right? And you know we like to be powerful, but God wants us to show real power by our gentleness. The picture here is that we submit ourselves and our power and our strength over to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes the reins of our strength and power and we allow that to go to Him. So that He can accomplish His purpose in our lives. But there's another list in Galatians chapter 5 we talked about a couple months ago that tells us something about His word gentleness. Because before Paul gives us the fruits of the Spirit, he gives us another list in Galatians called the acts of a sinful nature. And before we grow in the fruits of the Spirit, we need to pull the weeds of the sinful nature. You get that? And one of the words for sinful nature is the opposite of the word prautes. It is the opposite of gentleness in Galatians 5 and 20. It's outbursts 
of anger. And this is the opposite of gentleness. Gentleness is your frustration, anger, and aggravation under control of the Spirit. Outbursts of anger, outbursts of anger, your emotions, frustrations, and aggravations, you, you never know when it's going to boil over. And you've been around people like that. You never know when it's going to lash out and, and hurt someone. And words hurt worse than fists. And, and we, we, we all know some people in our lives that are even like that who are the opposite of gentle. Some characteristics of this person is a person who does not have this fruit of gentleness in their lives. They're very defensive. And you never know when they're going to, you know, you'll make them mad. And you, you, you might say something to them and you, you don't know really anything, you don't mean anything by it, you don't mean anything negative about it, but they kind of take it personal and, and you say to your spouse, you mind taking out the trash? And they say, what's that supposed to mean? I take out the trash all the time. I take out the trash just as much as you do. No, no, I take it out more than you do. And you're like, whoa. That's the opposite of gentleness. Or, or this person tends to be a little hypersensitive sometimes. And so it's, it's the person, this is a little bit of a volcano, if you know what I mean. People usually try to stay away from those type of people because they, they never know what's going to set them off. And it, it can be dangerous at times. Or it's, it's a mom or a dad where one minute everything's okay and the next minute the mom is yelling and the dad is yelling and the home becomes like a minefield where each step is a possible explosion. Fits of anger. And they can be very hard to deal with because they can say to your face, everything is fine, no problems. Are you sure? I mean, is there something that we need to talk about to get out in the open? No, I'm fine. And the door slams. And you knock on the door. Well, because, you know, there is this tension between us. Is everything okay? And they'll say, no, everything is fine. And then they will let go of their anger. And sometimes they will let it go when they're alone. And sometimes it could be an explosion with you know, who cares who's around. The person who is not growing in gentleness tends to be constantly critical. And so they're always frustrated by other people. Not doing something the way that they do it. And, 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 and they will always be frustrated when somebody has done something because clearly they could have done it better themselves. But they're just critical of everyone and everything. And they are in pain, honestly. That's what happens if you're not growing in those fields. Another sign of a person who is not growing in gentleness is lots of times they're in a bad mood. Just a constant sour face. And you ask them what's wrong and they don't know what's wrong. And I mean, you don't know. But, and they don't know either. And, and they're always kind of in this bad mood. So ask yourself, is gentleness a fruit that needs to be growing in your life? Is it a fruit that you need to pay closer attention to? And if, if you say no, then there are probably some friends and family who would say, oh, yeah, he does. Definitely need to pay attention to that. They need lots more focus in that area. They need to get some rhubarb the next time they're at the grocery store. <laughs> Gentleness is a fruit that is most of the time overlooked. And it is an area that many of us need to grow in. And so Paul gives us this definition of this idea of Gentleness. He gives us the opposite of gentleness, this outburst of anger. And so the definition of gentleness is turning your reins of your anger over to the Holy Spirit. Gentleness is turning the reins of your anger and ag ag aggravation over to the Holy Spirit. And biblically speaking, as we walk and as we keep in step with the Spirit, we turn the reins over to Him and he is allowed to control this area of our life. The hardest part is letting go and letting God take control. It should be the easiest thing we ever do, but it's always the hardest thing in it. Because we want to be controllers of everything. Galatians 5 and 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's lead in every part of our life. So as we walk with the Spirit, gentleness will grow. People think of gentleness as a personality trait. 
I mean, they, they think of gentleness as, as in their DNA, or it isn't. They associate gentleness with genetics. And so they say, well, it's not that I don't want to grow in gentleness, but you should see the family that I came from. I mean, my mom and dad are always fighting, throwing things, and, and you know, hitting each other. And we're, we're all just kind of hot-headed people in our family, which we're going to get into some genetics uh, tomorrow. So uh, surprise when you come. <laughs> We just got short fuses. I mean, I just, I just have an aggressive personality, okay? I just can't change that all of a sudden. No, you can't, but the Holy Spirit can, okay? That's the whole purpose of this thing. You can't, but He can. And so they, they write off this fruit of the Spirit as a personality trait that they don't have and they can't get. I mean, they wish they were a little more laid back, a little more easygoing, but they are not. And so they, they say, well, it's not on the menu for me, okay? I don't get rhubarb at the grocery store and it's not my personality. But that is not what the Bible teaches when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. You can say, I've been born with this type of personality. I may be born with a bad temper, but you cannot use it as an excuse to sin. And lots of times, it's easier to lash out in anger than in compassion. We need to reverse that. That sounds so... It's crazy. It, but it's all my dad would talk about during the season well, on the show. Did you see that last night? No, I didn't. When, uh, there was a time when Emmett Smith and Jerry Rice, they were, of course, football players, and they were on this show. And one thing I found out about the show is that uh, there would be different celebrities every season that come on the show and compete, you know, in this, with no dancing background. They had nobody knew how to dance at all. And it would start out very awkward. And they would show practices and stuff. And during practice sessions, they would stumble around as, you know, but as they would learn the next step, uh, the, the muscle memory would just kind of take over, right? And they would, they would get it. And they would days and days and practices, six and eight hours a day, and their, their feet would start to know what to do. But at first, dancing was very awkward and forced. But soon, with enough repetition... And with enough practice, it becomes more natural. And this is how it is when we are keeping in step with the Spirit. When you become a Christian, things don't change overnight. They do not change overnight, but they slowly change. Instead, you keep in step with the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit guides you, and over time, the fruits of the Spirit start to grow in your life. And people will like being around you then. And things like gentleness will start to be the new natural in our lives. Maybe today no one would say that you are a gentle person, but as you walk in the Spirit, the Spirit will start to make this fruit grow in your life. And it starts to be the new natural. When we keep in step with the Spirit, He will control the words that we speak. And when we think of anger and frustration and aggravation, and we think of how we talk, most of the time, the outbursts of anger show themselves through yelling and sarcastic you know, criticism through the words that we speak. In the New Testament, there is this connection with being filled with the Holy Spirit and how we talk and what we say. In Acts 4 and 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. So you know he spoke with a gentle voice. In Acts 4 and 25, you spoke long ago about the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David. In Acts 4 and 31, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. So there are many examples with being filled with the Holy Spirit. In James 1 and 26, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Those are some bold remarks from James. And so here's what this means. The way you talk to a telemarketer on the phone when you just sit down to eat pizza. Good conversation, some of them. Some of them is very short. 
The tone of your voice that you use when you're talking to your kids or your spouse. The way you speak to an employee who made a mistake. The words you choose at a sporting event. A few years ago, I showed this a few years back, me and Luke and Jake were at a basketball game, and they're probably early middle school. And there was a guy right behind me. I didn't know who it was. I didn't see him. And he was letting the F-bomb every few words. And Jake and Luke aren't, weren't used to that. And they looked at me and said, hey, what look at this guy saying? Yeah, I know what he's saying. And then he said it again. And I'm thinking, if he says it one more time to myself, i got to stand up and do something. Thank goodness the game ended. And I stood up. That dude is a lot bigger than me. A lot bigger. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't have to pull out the guns or anything. <laughs> yeah, but that was scary. But, but, or, or what you yell out when a car cuts you off in traffic. It has a way of showing whether or not you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And people are watching you. Your kids are watching you. I was talking to David just a few minutes ago because I noticed that Cooper, I went to shake his hand, and he looked me right in the eye, and he grabbed my hand, and he squeezed us a little bit. Very, very determined. It was powerful. And he talked, he learned from his dad. It has a way of showing whether or not you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 3 and 15, Peter specifically talks about how gentleness needs to show itself when Christians are defending their faith. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. There is this growing concern, though, on, on what we see in many Christians, that they're trying to stand up for truth, and they're trying to stand up for biblical values, and yet the things that they're doing is probably true, but they're doing it the wrong way. They're doing it a lot like the world. Show that next picture. All this stuff may be true but they're doing it the wrong way. We are to show the love of the Lord to this lost world. That is our job. That is our mission. And there is name calling and sarcastic words and signs that scream hatred and they are doing more damage than good. The Bible says that, that when we are defending your faith, that you should, we need to stand up. But do it with gentleness and respect. That's what Peter even said there. May they know that we are Christians by our love. Philippians 4 and 5. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. There should be something about you that when the world sees you, not just us, you, they see power and strength under control. And that is a witness for Jesus. Lee Strobel, which I, I think y'all have heard this story. Lee Strobel and his testimony changed my life. It, 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 was, it was the one thing the Lord used to grab my attention. I want to share it more. and I, I think I talked about it a few years ago. But he, he, he was a writer for the Chicago Tribune, and he writes about his gentleness impact on his family. He says, my daughter Allison was five years old when I became a follower of Jesus. All she had known for those five years was a dad who was self-centered and angry. I remember I came home one night and I kicked a hole in the living room wall just out of anger with life. I'm ashamed to think of the times when Allison hid in her room from her dad just to get away from me. Six months after I gave my life to Jesus, that little girl went to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he did for Daddy. All she knew was her dad used to be this way, very hard to live with. But more and more, her dad was becoming this way. And if that's what God does for people, she wants to do it too. And so your gentleness is a fruit that should attract people to Jesus Christ. But there is one person that best describes gentleness. And they were always picked on, made fun of, always misunderstood. No, he didn't win the best actor like the movie's characters we saw or win an Academy Award for his ability. Instead, he was falsely accused. He was mocked and made fun of. And he was beaten beyond the recognition of a man. 
And he hung on a cross until he died. And with everyone watching, he was at his lowest when he was raising us up to our highest. And some of the last words that Jesus said was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Kevin, come on up here. Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. We're going to do something just a little bit different. Just remain seated. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. I was, uh, I was thinking last night. Alpha shared his testimony. And, uh, you know, that, that just made me think how, you know, how important it is for people to do that. You know, because there could be, I mean, there could be ten people or there could be one person that is going through something in their life that they might need, you know, just that one thing that comes out of their testimony that, you know, that might make them realize, I need to, I need to change my life. I need to follow Jesus. And, you know, like I say, if, if it's just one person, that's awesome. But uh, about 15 years ago, on uh, June 8th, 2008, I uh, I had a accident, like it was a bad accident, uh, and I'm honestly I'm just I'm thankful to still be here. I mean I went through uh, I had a was riding a motorcycle and uh, lost control and went under a guardrail in between the post and under the guardrail. I don't know how you can fit this through that, but uh, you know. God found a way, but, you know, thinking back on that, you know, I had a double compound fracture in my femur and went through my femoral artery, and I remember after I finally, you know, came to and started, you know, processing what was going on, I didn't know what was going on at first, um, they had, uh, they had to put a tourniquet on my leg and everything because I was bleeding profusely, but, uh, you know, I remember a state trooper coming up and saying, looking over the guardrail and saying, what happened here? And I said, well, I guess I wrecked my motorcycle. And he said, well, that's a good thing you're alert, you know. And uh, I, he told me, he said, you know, we're going to have to have med flight. And I was thinking at the time, you know, well, med flight, that's expensive. I'm <laughs> Just take me to the hospital. And he said, you really need med flight and I was like well you know let me let me call my mom so while all that was going on you know I was trying to call my mom she answered the phone I told her you know mom don't freak out or anything but she was like what did you do so I said well I wrecked my bike and she was like okay well how bad is it? and I was like well it's not that bad my legs cut and you know I, I said I feel okay I'm hurting a little bit but well, the trooper got a hold of the phone and said, listen, he really needs to be flown somewhere. And then he told her what was going on. And, you know, all the way to the hospital, I was sitting there yakking at the flight nurse. And he, I asked him, I said, how am I? He said, I think you're going to be okay. And I was like, look, I can handle it. I said, honestly, how am I? And he said, well, honestly, he said, you're not supposed to be talking to me right now. And I was like, well, okay, I'll sit over here and hush then. And he, <laughs> he said, he said, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. He said, you can talk to me all you want. But he said, I don't even ha he said, you don't even have enough blood in your body for me to take your blood to find out what we need to fill you up with at the hospital. And I was like, wow, you know. And then just to think, I had went through all that didn't have enough blood in my body my blood pressure had dropped but I was still sitting there I remember to this day everything that was going on um you know I remember when I got to the hospital uh I remember my mom and my sister they were there and they came in and I I couldn't process why they were so upset because in my mind I was fine but you know they were they were torn up because you know they thought that was the last time they were ever, ever going to get to see me 
but uh you know up and up until that point i had been i you know i went to church um but i never i never i believed in god but i felt like you know i needed you know and i'm i don't know if anybody else has ever done this in here but i felt like i needed that sign you know you know just I, and I'd prayed about it like, you know, God, if you're if you're real and if you, you know, if you want me to follow you, then show me, you know, show me something, you know, give me a sign. And I, you know, I'd been looking for that sign, but, you know, to thank everything that I went through on that day, you know, thinking back, that was a heck of a sign. I mean, you know, to take a situation where, one, you know, I'm still lucky to be walking, lucky to have kept my leg, but lucky to have kept my life too. And I mean, God was the was there with me a hundred percent. And uh, you know, after after a surgery on Sunday, uh, the next thing the next thing I remember was my mom. She had woke me up and was. I could see she was talking, but, you know, there were no words whatsoever. And uh, she was holding the phone and, you know, like, here, here's the phone. And I, I answered the phone and uh, it was it was actually Jody that had called me. And, uh, you know, she she had been through this, you know, an accident, too, at the time. But I was like, you know, that's. And it was awesome just to hear, you know, just to be able to hear again and all that. Because, you know, after I was worried after my mom handed the phone to me and I couldn't hear anything. And then, you know, finally came back around. But, you know, for for the friends that I had and, you know, just that's sometimes that's what that's what somebody needs. It's just to, you know, hear some, hear a word of encouragement or you know, a testimony like that for, you know, for it to make sense to somebody. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just absolutely thankful to be, be able to stand up here in front of everybody and, uh, share that story. So, all right. Holy Father Standing off all I see Of all the things you have created Still you choose to think of me And who am I suffer your very life to set me free the only thing that I can give you is the life you gave to me this is my offer This is my offering to you, God. Well, I will give you my life, for it's all I have to give. Because you gave your life for me. I stand before you. 
at this altar So many have given you more I may not have much I can offer Yet what I have is truly yours This is my offering, dear Lord This is my offering to you, God Well, I will give you my life For it's all I have to give Because you gave your 